Okay, all right. Guys, we might get started, so just quiet down. Um, okay, first, first couple of things. Um, if you have any questions throughout, um, there'll be a lot of breaks throughout the presentation just to kind of do activities. If you want to ask any questions, please ask them then. All right. So this is the overview of what will be happening tonight. So we'll go through how OSCEs are different in third year compared to second year. And then the various things that you could be asked in a station. So history, examination, investigations, explanation and skills. Throughout this, I've dotted some awake breaks as well where we can do like practice differential generating um, just to stop everybody from going to sleep. Okay, so before we get started, um, I'm notorious for having a quiet voice, so if you can't hear me, tell me to speak up. Uh, this is also from my own perspective, so other people will give you slightly different um, advice and different views based on what their experience have been. It doesn't mean that they're right or, um, or I'm right or anything like that, it just means that the advice is different and you should probably listen to both. So the structure between third year and sorry, yeah, between second year and third year is different. So you still have a two minute reading time and an eight minute active station. But in this, the eight minute active station is independent of every other station. And most have two sections. So you'll have six minutes to do one activity and then two minutes of something else or four and four. You get 10 back to back independent active stations. And the number of rest stations is dependent on your site. So when I sat mine in Bendigo last year, we had three rest stations, but other people had two, um, and it's a bit variable depending on where you are. For histories, use your paper to write down all the differentials that you can think of, as well as everything else that you would normally do in history. There's no integration station, so you don't actually need to write during the station if you don't want to. I found it useful to collect my thoughts, but it's up to you. And practice is the key. So something that we did last year, which I think really helped, was getting our fifth year mentors to write STEMs and then run weekly practice sessions with us so that we pretty much nailed the OSCEs when they came around. All right, so um, a history station is pretty much the same as normal as you would have done in second year. So of course, introduction and consent, um, history of consent and complaint. The bit where it gets a bit different is here you wanna be generating differentials. So it's good to ask to generate at least five and to ask three closed questions on each. Um, due to the nature of the presenting complaint, a lot will have overlapping symptoms, which means that you can cut down on the number of questions that you're asking. But if you get stuck, it's a good idea to fall back on a systems review. The question you also want to ask yourself is why are they presenting now? And that's important for any risk factors or precipitating um, events that have led to them presenting. You want to know their medications um, and allergies. You want to know their past medical history, family history. But instead of asking, does your mum have any conditions or does your dad have any conditions, which takes forever for them to answer, it's a good idea to ask, do any conditions run in your family? Because it cuts down um, the amount of things that they'll give you and most of it will be important. Um, and then also social history. So here you don't need to know all of the essence stuff. You mainly need to know who they live with um, the alcohol history and smoking. So in terms of generating differentials, there's two main ways that you can do it. You can either use a systems-based approach or a surgical sieve. Personally, I like the systems-based approach better because it helps you think about different, different differentials from different systems, which ultimately in the OSCE is one of the things that they're looking for. So if you take shortness of breath as an example, your main causes will be cardiac, uh, respiratory and heme. Um, and then differentials that I'm sure you all know are things like pericarditis, pneumonia or anemia. But then you've also, you can also think of different things that many people wouldn't otherwise think of. So like some psychological, neurological or GIT causes. So things that can cause shortness of breath might be anxiety or a panic attack. Neurological causes could be things like a phrenic nerve injury um, or some other issue with innervation of the diaphragm or intercostal muscles. And GIT causes could be things like heartburn. Um, as for the surgical sieve, if you're getting stuck with a systems-based approach or your presenting complaints um, concentrates on one system, so like for a headache, most of the causes are going to be due to structures in the head, it's good to think about the surgical sieve. Um, the surgical sieve is essentially the Vindicate acronym, which is listed here, and just thinking about the different causes based on that. 
So things that are new this year in terms of systems reviews are infectious diseases. Um, when it comes to the actual OSCE and generating your differentials, you're probably not going to use this, but if you get really stuck, it's a good one to fall back on. And CHOCOLATES is your acronym with the letters listed there. The slides are up on the event page, so I won't bother um, spending too much time on this slide. The next one is occupational health, and again, um, most of the questions that you'll be asking will be differentials based. But as a backup, of, as your systems review policed, is a good one. Okay. Um, when it comes to occupational health, there's a few more things. So in your consult, you always want to talk about return to work planning and ask them about supports that they have in place, such as whether their workplace has a return to work liaison. Um, throughout the year, you'll be sent an email asking whether you want to participate in the John Desmond Prize. It's a set of 40 questions that if you do particularly well at, you can win some money. Um, even if you think you're not going to do that well at it, I think it's still a good idea to do because it gives you a practice run um, of what the questions will be like in your written exam. There's always an OSCE station on occupational health, but sometimes it's only in the STEM and not actually related to the active station that you're partaking in. Your top five complaints that you need to flag for occupational health uh, musculoskeletal pain, mental health um, problems of any kind, asthma, dermatitis and hearing loss. So if any of those come up, you need to think straight away that occupational health might be some questions that need to be asked. Okay, so we'll go through um, generating differentials for a history and how to actually do it. So a 35-year-old businesswoman presents to her GP with sudden onset shortness of breath. You have six minutes to take a history and the examiner will ask you questions for the remaining two minutes. You, want to, um, you need to generate differentials, question triads and risk factors for this. So I'll give you two minutes um, to do those things and then we'll get started. So if you've reached five differentials, some question triads and risk factors, just try and do as many more as you can. All right, so we might call it there. All right, so for me, when I was thinking about this, I just came up with five differentials because I didn't want to crowd the slide with heaps of words. So um, for sudden onset shortness of breath, I thought uh, PE, um, anxiety or a panic attack in a 35-year-old woman, anemia, pneumonia, and also thinking about cardiac causes, so things like an AMI or pericarditis. They're less likely in a 35-year-old woman, um, but still possible. As for the triads of questions that I'll be asking for these conditions, for a PE, uh, one of the main things you want to know is I guess the suddenness of onset and also whether they have pleuritic chest pain and then things that lead to it so swollen painful legs and also homoptysis. A panic attack you want to know about uh, associated symptoms that aren't psychological because people are less likely to say yes to those and more likely to say yes to the physical symptoms. So you're thinking about things like sweating, numbness and tingling especially around the mouth uh, and feeling like they're having a heart attack or they're dying. For anemia, uh, essentially the symptoms and causes of anemia, so any kind of bleeding. In a 35-year-old woman, your main source of bleeding would be menorrhagia. Uh, fatigue and shortness of breath worse on exertion. For pneumonia, 
uh, things like cough and sputum production, pleuric chest pain, and fevers, sweats, or chills. And for cardiac causes, all of your cardiac risk factors and symptoms, such as a high BMI, squeezing or heaviness in the chest, and nausea or sweating. Okay, so from those, the positives that we've got so far is she's having pleuritic chest pain, she has swollen red calves, and she's fatigued. Otherwise, all of your questions were negative. Um, from here, we want to think about risk factors for the conditions that, um, that are flagging, uh, just so that we save time during the OSCE station and don't ask about the risk factors that aren't important. So for this one, uh, with a, so at this point you're thinking probably a PE, but it could still be a cardiac cause. Um, and there's, I guess, other causes of things because the swollen red calves might not be related to the shortness of breath, although it would be silly not to think that they're linked. Um, so risk factors for a PE are essentially the Wells criteria. Uh, some of those could be recent prolonged immobilisation, such as if she's just had surgery or if she's been on a plane. Um, any hypercoagulable states, um, such as malignancy, pregnancy and oestrogen use. And then the last point of Virtue's triad is also injury to um, the blood vessels. So hypertension is a good one to ask as well. Any smoking or a previous DVT or PE will also put you at higher risk of getting a PE. And then for cardiac um, risk factors, you're thinking more about right heart failure in terms of these swollen red and legs. So, so to cause right heart failure, you're thinking more things like intravenous drug use causing infectious endocarditis, severe lung disease or heart conditions as a child that can cause um, right heart failure later in life. Okay, so then once we take those into account, the positives that we get so far is she's got pleuritic chest pain, swollen red and calves, fatigue, she fractured her ankle two weeks ago and required surgery for that. She recently came back from the USA and she's on the oral contraceptive pill, which puts her in a hypercoagulable state. Otherwise, all of her history is negative. So at this point, out of your differentials, you're thinking that your top one is a PE. So the question that you're asked by the examiner at this point, you have two minutes to answer it, is, ex uh, is explain what your top differential is. So explain that it's a P and why. You also need to explain why all of the other differentials are less likely. So you could say for anemia, she has no history of menorrhagia um, or any other sites of bleeding. Um, the next question that you get asked is what is the gold standard diagnostic investigation for a PE and what additional investigation must be done before it may be used. So I'll just give you a second to think about that before I change to the next slide. Okay, so the gold standard for a PE is a CTPA um, and the additional blood test that must be done first is a UEC. So essentially because you're putting contrast through a person uh, when you're doing the CTPA. If their kidneys aren't able to tolerate that contrast, you can't do it. We'll talk a bit more about this later as well. Uh, histories to be prepared for are all of these, and we'll go through them during our awake breaks today. Um, also, things that you want to think about is anything else that will trip people up or has multi-system differentials. Um, but yeah, we'll go through all of these and the slides are up, so don't bother taking them down just yet. So, first awake break time. Um, so I'll give you two minutes to have a read of this uh, to come up with at least five differentials and what question triads you'd like to ask.
So we're at one minute now. Does anybody need more time to think of more differentials? I'll take that as a no. Okay. So I just picked five. Um, just because you picked different ones doesn't mean that they're wrong. It just means that they're not the ones that I picked. Um, so when you're thinking about this, uh, the way that I thought about it is common things are common. And just because they have a fever and they're a return traveller doesn't mean that their fever is due to their travel. They could just get have an urty. It's the most common cause of a fever and it's also the most common cause of a fever in a return traveller. Um, other specific things for travel um, are food poisoning. Uh, malaria, if they're going to a malaria endemic region, dengue and STIs and UTIs. So we had a tutor on this last year where they told us that STIs seem to be more common in return travellers for whatever reason. They just get a bit wild while they're over there. Um, and then UTIs because they're common. So certain uh, questions that you could ask are the ones listed here. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the questions are the same. So myalgia is listed twice. So, so myalgia is listed here. And here, bitten by a mosquito is listed twice, um, things like that. So you can cut down on the amount of time that you spend asking these questions because they'll come up for multiple uh, differentials. The next one is chest pain. So I'll give you a minute to think about at least five differentials for this one as well. Okay, so that's a minute. All right, so the key to this one um, is that the chest pain is worse on ins is that the chest pain is worse on inspiration, um, and to adjust your differentials accordingly. So the six P's of pleuritic chest pain is a good one to think about. So your six P's are pneumonia, uh, pleurisy, pulmonary embolus, pleural effusion, pneumothorax, and pericarditis, um, and then your symptoms listed there. Um, yeah, note, probably the only important thing to note is that there's some things that will come up in your history of presenting complaint here that you won't need to ask again. So things like whether it's sudden onset, which for three of the differentials, that's something that's important. Um, whether they have associated shortness of breath with their chest pain, which comes up in two of the differentials, and also risk factors. Um, such as surgery, cancer, or the oral contraceptive pill in a pulmonary embolus. Um, all of this is up on the event page as well. All right, so moving on to the examination. Um, essentially, all of your exams are the same as last year in terms of what they're assessing content-wise. The only difference is that this year, um, a focused examination means you get four minutes to do it, and if they don't mention the word focused, it means that you get six minutes to do your exam. A um, couple of things to be aware of. Um, it's possible that during the exam they could give you a patient with a common chronic finding that they could standardise across all of the sites. Um, so something like a mitral regurge murmur or wheeze could be possible in the patient that you get. Um, and it's also good to brush up on the skills that you don't often do, like taking the blood pressure. When you're doing a fo focused examination, what you're essentially looking for here is signs that will point to the diagnosis that you're thinking of from the history that they've given you. All right, so an example examination is a focused cardiorespe exam on a patient who in the stem has symptoms that suggest heart failure. Um, other things that you could get are like an abdominal exam, just a full one, um, a full cranial nerves exam, 
and a focused thyroid exam for hypothyroidism. So essentially here, you need to practice all of your exams um, and know what the positive findings mean because in your focused examination, if you look for things that aren't indicative of the differentials that you're examining, so say that you get somebody who has heart failure and in your cardiac examination you look for splinter hemorrhages, it's probably not, it's wasting time. And when you've got four minutes, it's not going to give you as many points as going straight to the chest and having a listen to their heart. Okay, so second awake break. So uh, a minute for this one. Also, any questions so far? And there's your minute. All right, so the differentials that I came up with, um, because he's a 52-year-old man, you can start thinking more things like pancreatitis because his alcohol consumption over his life is could be enough by the time that you're 52 that you could get pancreatitis. Um, same with gallstones. Um, perforated peptic ulcer and the various symptoms with that. Uh, because he's in his 50s, he could have gorge or any um, acute coronary syndrome, such as an AMI or angina. And also thinking about different systems to just GI things. Uh, a lower lobe pneumonia as well can also present as epigastric pain. All right, so the next one, um, I'll give you a minute for this one as well. Okay, then there's your minute. So for headache, because there's not many things that like aren't in your head or your face that will cause a headache, um, I think it's more useful to use a vi uh, the surgical sieve for this one using the Vindicate maximum. So differentials that I have here, um, I like to think of them in terms of benign causes of headache and serious causes of headache. So I uh, put up a couple of benign causes. So migraine is one of those. And then your serious causes of headache are things like a subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, because a hemorrhagic stroke obviously can, you can die. Uh, giant cell arteritis because if you leave it untreated it can cause permanent vision loss. A brain tumour for obvious reasons and acute glaucoma because you can permanently lose sight if you leave it untreated. So these are how they present. Uh, and the last one for this awake break is fatigue. So I'll give you a minute for that one as well.
Okay, and there's a minute. So when it comes to fatigue, um, the symptoms, sorry, the systems that I think are really important to go over are first of all their sleep. So if you don't have sleep for whatever reason, you'll be fatigued. Um, then also heme and endo. Uh, psych for depression, um, or like any roomy cause will tend to cause fatigue. And then any other infection or cancer. So um, in terms of sleep, sleep apnea or sleep apnea in a partner is a good one to ask for, um, of which the symptoms are listed there. Anemia, hypothyroidism, depression and cancer. Um, probably important to note that most GP presentations for fatigue won't have any pathology behind them and they'll just be tired because sometimes life gets on top of people. All right, so questions following, his, so to round up the history and examination part of this presentation, um, common questions that you could get following a history and examination station in those either four or two minutes that are left. Uh, what investigations would you like to do uh, to please interpret these investigations? And then they'll give you something to interpret. And you'll just need to say the positive findings and uh, that it's otherwise normal. Um, if it's a blood test, the normal ranges will usually be on the side, so it's not too hard. Um, what your differentials are, what is the most likely diagnosis and why that is, uh, what your management plan is, which in two minutes is usually pretty basic, it's just good to go through a very basic like conservative medical surgical approach, um, and then to please explain to the patient about their condition and management plan, which if that happens will be four minutes rather than two. All right. Uh, so to open investigations, um, these, when you're thinking about investigations, I find it's always useful to think about it in terms of a bedside, bloods, imaging, and then special tests approach, and to break it up that way. Um, those are the examples of the different tests that consist in each of those categories. Um, when, it, when they ask you for multiple investigations, rather than like what investigation would you like to do or what would you most like to do. Um, it's good to list all of the ones in bold, but the catch to that is it's good to be able to justify it as well. So if somebody presents to you and says that, they're, uh, that they have chest tightness and they feel like they're having a heart attack, um, the renal functions might not be that important unless you want to do a scan. Uh, so if you say, I would like to do some... Um, CTPA because they might be having a PE and want to understand their renal function uh, as per contrast, then that's justifiable. But if you just say, I want to know what their sodium level is because I feel like it, that's not going to cut the mustard. Um, but all of the ones listed are good ones to um, rattle off if you need to. Okay, and then interpreting investigations is the next one. Um, so the most important ones to know how to interpret are a chest x-ray, an ECG and urinalysis. Um, they could also ask you to report on a PATH report. Um, essentially everything will be written there, you'll just need to explain it to the patient in layman's terms or um, explain about their prognosis or some part of their um, diagnosis to the examiner. So when you're doing this, um, there's three main parts. So you need to note their patient demographics, the modality used and their symptoms at the time. That's important. You need to do that for everybody. Uh, like just take a quick look at it and state what's normal and abnormal and correlate this to the symptoms. And then if you've got time, be systematic and uh, go through all the steps that you've learnt for that. So for chest x-ray, I use like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Um, and just go through like airway, bones, cardiac borders, um, all of that sort of thing. And then for ECG, like the 12 steps. All right, so an example is an ECG interpretation. So for this, an 80-year-old man is found unconscious on the ward. Um, you've been, you have performed basic life support on him and have been asked to interpret this ECG. Okay, so taking a look at it, think about what you'd say. Uh, so this is what I would say. Um, obviously, for something that looks like that, you can't go through and figure out what the axis of their heart is and what their PR interval is. 
um, but you can state their patient demographics for modality and the symptoms. So the modality is ECG and his symptom is that he was found unconscious in the ward. Uh, state what it is, which is a monomorphic VT. It's good to include the monomorphic part because you can also have polymorphic VT, which is dorsal, um, and also the rate. The next one is an x-ray interpretation. So this is a 40-year-old woman presenting to a GP with fevers, dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, and a productive cough. So aside from a temperature of 37.8, her vitals were normal. Uh, these are the results of her chest x-ray. You've got four minutes to interpret this x-ray and then answer the following questions. So in that four, so you need to take a quick look, figure out, um, so there's all of her demographics and things, figure out what's obviously abnormal and state that, and then go through systematically. So we can just go back for a sec. So in this, what I would say is, so this is a 40-year-old woman who's presenting to her GP with symptoms suggestive of a pneumonia, which are fevers, dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, and a productive cough. Uh, um, on this chest X-ray, the most obvious abnormality is a right mid-zone opacity, which can be seen here, um, and some, blunt, some mild blunting of the costodiaphragmatic recess. So these findings are consistent with a right middle lobe pneumonia and some minor pleural effusion, which is most likely associated with that pneumonia. And then if I had time, I'd go through the rest of it and go her airway um, looks patent and normal. Her bones, it does not appear that there is any fractures. Her cardiac borders are both present and look normal. Um, her diaphragm looks normal. There's no flattening or things like that. Okay, um, so then once you've gone through all of that, the examiner asks you, given her history, what is the most likely causative organism? How would you decide on the level of severity of her pneumonia? And what is the most appropriate management for her? So you have a think about it, kind of stall for a couple of moments, and then you would say something like this. Um, okay, so x-ray interpretation on the side. And then um, that she's presenting as a typical pneumonia of which your three main organisms are strep pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, and Moraxella cateralis. Out of those, the most common is a strep pneumoniae, and that is most likely what she has. Um, for severity, there's a few severity rating scales, for example, SMART, COP, or CURB 65. And using those, um, she'd score quite low, so she would be considered to have a mild community-acquired pneumonia. For that, the most appropriate treatment is to treat with amoxicillin only. Some spot diagnoses for blood tests or blood films that you could get. So if we're thinking about buzzwords, what is this? Allies, yep. Which correlates to what? Not quite, but very close. So allies, I'm quite sure, is a Reed-Sternberg cell, which correlates to Hodgkin's lymphoma. For this one? Uh, yeah, that's one buzzword. So these are hypochromic cells of various shapes. Um, there are some pencil cells visible, as well as some target cells I'm sure would be around somewhere. That kind of looks like a target cell. Um, there's also some leukocytes present, um, of which this appears normal and this appears plastic. But because there's only one in the film, you wouldn't say anything about leukemia. So having said all of that, that it's hyperchromic, uh, there's pencil cells, uh, probably target cells present, what would you say the diagnosis is? Yeah, iron deficiency anemia. Great. All right, so next break. Um, so, I'll give you a minute for this one too.
Okay, so even though this is, I guess, more of a peed station, um, the unexplained weight loss part is something that you could get as a STEM. I just picked a paediatric patient because it makes the differentials a bit more interesting. So that's a minute. Um, so the differentials that I came up with, um, so anorexia nervosa has to be on that list. Um, type 1 diabetes mellitus, because she's 12, so it's about the right time for them to present. Any inflammatory bowel diseases um, and associated fistulas with those. Um, so we're thinking things like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. She's a bit young to be developing that, but the time is adolescence to early adulthood. So it's still possible. Um, any kind of cancer, even though she's 12 and it's unlikely, it's still possible. Um, and also depression in a 12-year-old would have the same sort of symptoms as it would in an adult. Sorry, say that again. The body hair. So when they get, like they lose quite a lot of weight and have a BMI probably around 12, 13, on the verge of needing hospitalisation, they just seem to grow this like soft, downy, peach fuzzy kind of hair. The idea behind that is it helps keep them warm because they don't have the body fat to do it. Um, yeah, I don't know, really know why it happens, it just does. Okay, so this is the next one. Okay, so that's a minute. Um, so differentials that, so when you're thinking about collapse, um, one way that I learnt, and I think it's a good way to think about it, is thinking about neurological and cardiac causes, and then other is the other category, and other fits into things like metabolic, so if they're hypoglycemic, um, or have some sort of vestibular dysfunction, or things like that. Um, there's also a cool mnemonic, which is, I think it's three S's and three V's, I can't quite remember what they stand for, but if you look it up, I'm sure it exists somewhere on the internet. Okay, so things that it could be. So he's playing rugby, so there's potentially a history of trauma. Um, so concussion should be on your differentials. Hypoglycemia always, and especially because he's exercising. Uh, hypoglycemia is one of those things that always needs to be on your differentials for any kind of altered conscious state, because if you miss it, they'll die, and it's so easy to pick up. Um, it's something that I don't think many people get sued over because they remember it, but uh, an ED physician once told me that uh, when you're resussing somebody, the mnemonic is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So A, B, C as in airway, breathing, um, circulation, and then don't ever forget glucose. Arrhythmias, uh, hokum in a 21-year-old man, and seizures as well could all be causes of collapse. Nausea and vomiting is the next one.
If it helps, I picked all the hard differentials because I figure everybody knows the easy things like shortness of breath and chest pain. These are the hard ones. Okay, so that's a minute. All right, so differentials that I had for this one in a, how old was she? She was 30. Um, pregnancy, always really important. Um, and then all of uh, your GI things, so things like gastroenteritis and cord can also cause nausea and vomiting. Um, and then neurological things such as a migraine or a raised intracranial pressure can also cause nausea and vomiting. So they're probably your three main systems. So gynae things, um, gastric and neurological causes of nausea and vomiting. Let's move on. So our next section is explanation stations. So I've just gone through the different explanation stations that you can get. The first one is disease education. Um, so the things that you need to do in disease education or really for any explanation station is to check your knowledge, chunk and check, draw, diagram and give take home information. Um, when you're in an OSCE, giving take home information can be pretty clunky, being like folding a piece of paper, here is your pamphlet. Um, so in reality, it's probably a bit better to say something like, I'd like to give you some take home information, but unfortunately I don't have any, or here are some sites that I can refer you on to if you know any, if you don't, just say the first bit that you don't have any. Um, so my structure in terms of thinking about it is investigations, differentials, management, and then social things. So essentially going through the dogma that everybody learns of history, examination, investigations, differentials, management. Um, so for diagnosis, Educating the patient about their diagnosis and the, the things that they can do to prevent uh, that from happening again. So if they've just had an AMI, thinking about their risk factors such as their weight, their smoking status, um, alcohol intake, physical activity and nutrition. A good mnemonic for that is SNAP. So S for smoking, N for nutrition, A for alcohol and P for physical activity. You've probably come across it before. And SNAP everybody is what I've once heard. Uh, investigations, so what further investigations need to be done for the diagnosis that they have might be monitoring in the future. Um, management, so the different treatment options that they have, which also include risk factor modification, uh, complications that they can have from their management and what monitoring and follow-up needs to happen. And then social, so if they have a notifiable disease, thinking about things like does the uh, government need to be notified or uh, does their workplace need to be notified, um, their social support. So are they able to tell their husband slash wife themselves or would you, they like you to tell them? Um, and any infectious contacts that they might have. And then always a good way to finish is to ask the patient if they have any final questions. Okay, so the next explanation station that you can get is a consent for a procedure. Um, so again, with any explanation station, check knowledge, chunk and check, draw a diagram and give take home information. Uh, the things that you want to go over are what they are being consented for. So to say, I've come in to consent you for a colonoscopy. Uh, what the indication for that uh, procedure is. So investigation of PR bleeding is a good indication for a colonoscopy. Uh, the procedure itself, so before, during and after. So before, um, we'll give you a medication called PicoPrep, which will essentially give you intense diarrhoea for, from the time that you take it to about... 24 to 48 hours afterwards. Uh, and then we'll get you to come in for a day procedure. You'll be given light sedation, that sort of thing, during the procedure so that they'll be lightly sedated and then a PR examination will be done. Um, a scope will be inserted in through their anus and will travel back around to their retrocecal valve. Or you could just say uh, it's essentially investigating all of your large bowel in layman's terms. Um, and then after the procedure, so the scope will be removed, you'll be woken up from your light sedation um, and that there's no, you won't need to be admitted to the hospital and you can go home on the same day. The risks of the procedure. So I use this mnemonic pretty similar to um, chest x-rays and this stands for A for anaesthetics, B is bleeding, C is clots, D is disease, so I think about like infection being disease. E doesn't really stand for anything. 
F is failure of the procedure and G is like grazing of nearby structures. So uh, for a colonoscopy, the things that you want to say is the anaesthetic <coughs> risks are quite low because they're using a light sedation. However, that because we're giving you a medication, there's risks inherent with that, that you could have an allergic reaction to that medication or that it might not work because you may respond a way different to what we were expecting you to. Um, bleeding risk is pretty minimal for a um, colonoscopy. Clots are as well because you're not immobilised for long enough. Infection is always a risk, but because like it's a colonoscopy, it's a fairly bacteria-loaded place anyways, um, and the normal flora will usually stop any major infections from happening. That the procedure could fail and that they might have some pathology that gets missed on colonoscopy, and that, a near, and that they could perforate the bowel is a risk of colonoscopy. Um, also, medico-legally, you need to think about this in terms of a reasonable and an anxious patient. So if you have a patient sitting in front of you who is asking you specific questions, you need to answer them um, to the full extent that you know. Um, but I think for a reasonable patient, that mnemonic works quite well. Long-term risks from the procedure. So for a colonoscopy, there aren't really many long-term risks. Um, alternatives and the risks and benefits of doing nothing. So for a colonoscopy, if the indication is PR bleeding, you need to explain that the main risk is that they could have bowel cancer. Um, and the colonoscopy is the best way to investigate that. Uh, considering that they do have known PR bleeding, there's not really any alternatives that can be done apart from perhaps a contrast and abdominal x-ray of their bowel looking for any uh, lumen occluding lesions. Um, the risk of doing nothing is that their um, bowel cancer could go undetected and they could end up with metastatic disease. Uh, benefit of doing nothing is that they don't have to undergo a colonoscopy, but that's about it. Uh, any final questions that the patient would have? And then remember to actually get their consent. So now that you've done all of that beautiful consenting, you need to remember to ask them, is it okay if we do this procedure on you? Uh, the next explanation station that you could get is, yep. Yep. Okay, so A is anaesthetics, B, bleeding. C, clots, D, disease, which is infection, E doesn't stand for anything, F is failure of the procedure, and G is grazing of nearby structures, or which is essentially just damaging other things or perforating whatever you're looking at. <coughs> okay, so for medication, uh, again, for any explanation station, chunk and check, check their knowledge, draw a diagram and give them take-home information. The things that you want to go through with the medication are background on the drug, so why they need the medication in the first place, uh, what it will do for them, and how does it work generally, and remember to put all of that in layman's terms. Uh, and then taking it start to finish, so thinking about the dosing interval and how often that they'll have to take it for, and for how long. So if it's antibiotics that they don't have to take for the rest of their lives, how long do they actually have to take it for? Uh, the route, so thinking about whether it's oral, sublingual, etc. Uh, special instructions, whether they need to take it with food. And for certain medications, there'll be certain special instructions. So for bisphosphonates, this could involve standing upright after taking it. Um, interactions of the drug and complications. So interactions, uh, think about your non-drug interactions as well. So if you're consenting somebody from the oral contraceptive pill, it's always a great thing to remember to mention grapefruit juice. Um, complications from steroids are uh, Cushing's and then monitoring of the medication. So for something like warfarin, where they'll have to get weekly INRs, it's good to mention that when you're consenting them, sorry, explaining their medication in the first place. Once you've done all of that, it's always a good idea to arrange a follow-up appointment for two reasons. First one, you want to check how the drug's working in them and whether they're having any side effects and whether there's anything going wrong with the actual drug itself. And the second thing is arranging regular follow-up will actually enhance their compliance in taking that drug. Okay, explanation practice. So, a 26-year-old woman presents to the ED with intense headache, photophobia and neck stiffness. Examination findings and initial blood tests are consistent with meningitis. Your ED consultant asks you to consent the patient for a lumbar puncture. So you have six minutes to consent her and you'll be asked two minutes of questions. So I'll give you a minute to think about what you would say if you were consenting her. 
and then I'll ask you the questions. Okay, so I had a lot more than a minute to think about what I would say if I was asked this question. So this is my answer. So start off, check knowledge, uh, chunk and check. When I do this, I'd probably only do it once and I'd potentially do it halfway through or at the end and say, um, now that I've explained all of this information to you, it's really important uh, for me legally that you understand it. Could I get you to repeat some of what I, your understanding of what I've said so that I know that you know um, like what's happening. Draw a diagram, give take home information. So what you want to start by saying is that they need a lumbar puncture um, and what a lumbar puncture actually is so that it's a needle that goes into the spine to take a sample of fluid from around the spinal cord and we use it to look to see whether there's any abnormalities with that. Um, that, so what her indication is, so that her symptoms suggest meningitis, and that the lumbar puncture will help rule this in or out. Then steps of the procedure, so that before, um, so she'll need to lie down for at least two hours after the lumbar puncture, so it's a good idea to go to the toilet before she has one. That she'll need to change into a hospital gown and lie on her side with her knees curled up to her chin. That during, her back will be washed with iodine or chlorhex, um, that the person performing it will gown and glove. Local anaesthetic will be applied into her back so she shouldn't feel anything. That she'll need to lie very still and that the spinal needle will be inserted. Um, depending on her level of knowledge, you probably don't need to tell her that it's in between L4 and L5, but if she's a med student, then it's probably a good idea to mention it. Uh, bleeding, so that, so anaesthetic risk is minimal because she's only under local anaesthetic. Uh, bleeding risk is minimal. There's no risk of clots because she won't be immobilised for long enough. Uh, the infection risk is minimal because it's a sterile procedure. Uh, the failure of the lumbar puncture is a real risk and they might need to try again if the sample is blood stained or they're not able to get a sample. And grazing. Um, so that an inherent risk of this is that you're dealing with needles close to the spinal cord and that the spinal cord could get nicked in the process. It's quite rare, but still possible. And for us to just check to see if that's happened, you need to report any numbling or ting numbness or tingling in your legs or groin or any issues going to the toilet or things like that after the procedure. For an anxious patient, um, we've just discussed the risk of spinal cord injury and how small it is. So long-term risks of a lumbar puncture are very minimal, but if she has symptoms, um, to come back and if they, if her pain or her headache or anything gets worse more than 48 hours after the lumbar puncture, it's a good idea to come back as well. That alternatives, because they suspect that she has meningitis, you could just treat it, but then they don't know what the organism is and the wrong antibiotics might be used, uh, which means that the bacteria may not be cleared at all. Um, if it's a bacterial meningitis or really anything that's not a virus, uh, there's quite a high chance of death if no treatment is initiated um, and the organism is anything other than a virus. Before you can send her, you need to ask her whether she has any final questions and answer those and then actually get the consent. So say, now that I've explained all of that to you um, and we've just had a chat about how you understand it, uh, do you agree to the lumbar puncture? Okay, so questions that the examiner may ask you afterwards. Uh, the results of the lumbar puncture are this. So the appearance is cloudy. Um, there's, you can see all of the things and the culture is pending. 
So what do these results indicate? So it's good to first interpret them and say that uh, in the context of these reference values, she has raised white cells, a decreased glucose and raised protein and that this pattern is suggestive of a bacterial meningitis. The most likely causative organism of a bacterial meningitis, so there's three of them on the next slide, um, are Neisseria meningitidis, of which meningococcal meningitis, that's the causative agent, um, Streptococcus pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenza. So the way that I like to think about it is Neisseria meningitidis meningitis is like in the title of the bacteria, and then otherwise your pneumonia pathogens. So strep pneumonia, haemophilus influenza. Myroxella doesn't really feature on the list, surprisingly. But um, out of those, the most likely is Neisseria meningitidis. It's just the most common. Okay, uh, the other explanation station that you could get is disease counselling, so that somebody comes to you with, um, in this case, PATH results, that you need to interpret them um, and explain to the patient what that means. So for this one, um, a 60-year-old 60 60 year old woman presents to you, the general surgeon, following a breast lumpectomy for follow-up and results. They are as follows. A breast tissue sample of 4 by 4 by 4 centimetres contained a mass of 1.5 uh, times 1.5 times 1 centimetre with clear margins. Microscopic evaluation found a well-differentiated neoplastic mass of cells within the lumen of the lactiferous duct. These cells did not penetrate the muscular layer. The neoplastic cells were ER positive, PR negative and HER2 negative. No lymph nodes were included in the sample. So the things you need to think about are how you would explain this to the woman and what treatment options does she have. So when I was thinking about how to explain it, um, to do all of the initial things, so to check knowledge, uh, chunk and check, draw a diagram, give take home information, to explain that uh, she has an excellent prognosis first because as soon as anybody ever suspects cancer, they think they, they're going to die. So if you tell them that they have an excellent prognosis and the risk of them dying is quite low, that's always a good way to start. Uh, the, the pathology that she has is consistent with a kind of breast tumour called a ductal carcinoma in situ and that means that the... Uh, cancer cells are within the duct um, and it hasn't gone through the muscular layer on the outside. That while this cancer is malignant and has a low risk of metastases and given the fact that it hasn't gone anywhere other than the duct uh, that's, and it's well differentiated and has clear margins, that's, almost, that's a better indicator that she will have a low risk of metastases. Uh, to explain to her that her tumour would be responsive to certain kinds of chemotherapy. And if it's ER positive, PR negative and HER2 negative, you can't use any kind of HER2 drugs like trastuzumab. So you're limited, in a 60-year-old woman, uh, you're limited to CIRMs like tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors, um, like anastrozole, I think is one. Uh, that recurrence is possible and she'll need six to 12 monthly mammograms and examinations for five years after, um, yeah, after this, that she'll need adjuvant therapy like radiotherapy and chemotherapy um, and that these exist simply to decrease the recurrence rate and it's recommended that they're followed but they're not actually going to do anything more to cure the disease um, and that she's just had a lumpectomy so that reconstructive surgery and prostheses are available if she wants them. Um, last thing to brush up on is skills. So skills can also be tested in an OSCE station and they routinely are each year, at least one. Um, skills that are good to brush up on is basically anything in your logbook, but in particular um, basic life support, taking vitals, placing ECG leads and inserting a urinary catheter into a model. Um, but yeah, essentially anything in the skill sections of your logbook are good things to practice. And when you're thinking about them, uh, think also how to explain that procedure that you're about to do. So for a urinary catheter, um, thinking about contraindications. So if they have hematuria or some kind of like injury to their penis and they're a male, um, then that's a contraindication for a urinary catheter. Okay, a week break. So the next one is PR bleeding.
else, I think, than Ilya. Sorry, I'm not too much longer to go. Okay, um, so differentials that I had for this one um, were any other perineal bleeding. So just because they say PR bleeding, you need to like figure out where it's actually coming from and whether the blood's on the paper or in the bowl and that sort of thing. So it could be uh, hematuria, um, vaginal bleeding or any other just perineal lesion. So if they have like a bleeding something on their vulva, then that could be the cause of their PR bleeding as well. Um, then causes of actual PR bleeding. There's really only four. So you can have bowel cancer, and if we're talking about frank blood on the toilet paper, um, then it has to be distal, and then associated symptoms of those are listed. Hemorrhoids and anal fissure, and uh, itchiness that is so bad that they scratch their skin and cause themselves to bleed. Um, yeah. So as for like frank blood on the toilet paper, they're really only the four causes. Okay, the next one is shoulder pain. Okay, um, so for this one, uh, I had like really auto surge kind of causes, room causes, and then referred pain is what I thought about. So for more like auto surge structural causes, uh, like a rotator cuff injury um, or nerve impingement for roomy kind of things like a rheumatoid arthritis. Oste Surprisingly, when I was reading into this, because I wanted to come up with good differentials, osteoarthritis for some reason is quite uncommon in the shoulder. Not sure why, just is. Uh, so rheumatoid arthritis and polymyalgia rheumatica as well. And then referred from the diaphragm. So like if they have some sort of irritation or peritonitis affecting their diaphragm, um, then they can also have shoulder All right, and that was all. So, um, hopefully you guys found that useful. Were there any closing questions before we all head off? Were there any questions from any rural sites? Gonna take that as a no. Okay, <laughs> so, um, yeah, thanks for coming guys. Hope it was good.